Chapter 2 Right Defence and Release from Fear The Real Meaning of Possession The real meaning of possession should be clarified. Fear of possession is a perverted expression of the fear of the irresistible attraction of God. The truth is still that the attraction of God is irresistible at all levels and the acceptance of this totally unavoidable truth is only a matter of time. But you should consider whether you want to wait because you can return now if you choose. Possession is a concept which has been subject to numerous distortions some of which we will list below. Type 1. Possession can be associated with the body only. If this occurs, sex is particularly likely to be contaminated. Possession versus being possessed is apt to be seen as the male versus the female role since neither will be conceived of as satisfying alone, and both will be associated with fear, this interpretation is particularly vulnerable to psycho psychosexual confusion. Type 2. From a rather similar reference point, possession can also be associated with things. This is essentially a shift from type 1 and is usually due to an underlying fear of associating possession with people. In this sense, it is an attempt to protect people from one's possessiveness, like the superstition about protecting the name we mentioned before. Both type 1 and type 2 are likely to become compulsive for several reasons, including a. They represent an attempt to escape from the real possession drive, which cannot be satisfied this way. B. They set up substitute goals, which are usually reasonably easy to attain. C. They appear to be relatively harmless, and thus seem to allay fear. The fact that they usually interfere with good interpersonal relationships can be interpreted in this culture as a lack of sophistication on the part of the other, not the self, and this induces a false feeling of confidence in the solution. It is also fairly easy to find a partner who shares the illusion. Thus we have any number of relationships which are actually established on the basis of type 1 and others which hold together primarily because of a joint interest in type 2. D. The manifestly external emphasis which both entail seems to be a safety device, and thus permits a false escape from much more basic inhibitions. As a compromise solution, the illusion of interpersonal relating is preserved, along with the retention of lack of love. This kind of psychic juggling leaves the juggler with a feeling of emptiness, which is, in fact, is perfectly justified, because he is acting from scarcity. He then becomes more and more driven in his behaviour to fill the emptiness. When these solutions have been invested with extreme belief, type 1 leads to sex crimes, and type 2 to stealing. The kleptomaniac is a good example of the latter. Generally, three types of emotional disturbance result. A. The tendency to maintain the illusion that only physical is real. This produces depression. B. The tendency to invest the physical with non-physical properties. This is essentially magic and tends more towards anxiety proneness and see the tendency to facilitate from one to the other, which produces a corresponding facilitation between depression and, and, and anxiety. All three result in self-imposed starvation. Type 3. Another type of distortion is seen in the fear or in the desire for spirit possession. 
The term spirit is profoundly debased in this context, but it does entail a recognition of the body. It is not enough, and investing it with magic will not work. This recognition accepts the fact that neither type 1 nor 2 is sufficient, but precisely because it does not limit fear so narrowly, it is more likely to produce greater fear to its own right. Endowing the spirit with human possessiveness is a more inclusive error than type 1 or 2, and a step somewhat further away from the right mind. Projection is also more likely to occur with facilitation between grandiosity and fear. Religion, in a distorted sense, is also more likely to occur in this kind of error, because the idea of a spirit is introduced through feliciously, though feliciously, while it is excluded from type 1 and type 2. Witchcraft is thus particularly apt to be associated with type 3 because of the much greater investment in magic. It should be noted that type 1 involves only the body, and type 2 involves an attempt to associate things with human attributes. Type 3, on the other hand, is a more serious level confusion because it endows the spirit with evil attributes. This accounts both for religious seal of its proponents and the aversion or fear of its opponents. Both attitudes stem from the same false belief. This is not what the Bible means by filled with the Holy Spirit. The concept of speaking in many tongues was originally an injunction to communicate to anyone in his own language or at his own level. It's hardly meant to speak in a way that nobody could understand. This strange error occurs when people do understand the need for universal communication but have contaminated it with the possession fallacy. The fear engendered by this misperception leads to a conflicted state in which communication is attempted, but the fear is allayed by making this communication incomprehensible. It could also be said that the fear induces selfishness or regression, because incomprehensible communication is hardly a worthy offering from one son of God to another. Type 4. Knowledge can also be misinterpreted as a means of possession. Here the content is not physical and the underlying fallacy is more likely to be the confusion of mind and brain. The attempt to unite non-physical content with physical attributes is illustrated by statements like the thirst for knowledge. This is not what thirst in the Bible means. The term was used only because of humanity's limited comprehension and is probably better dropped. The fallacious use of knowledge can result in several errors, including a. the idea that knowledge will make the individual more attractive to others. This is a possession fallacy. b. the idea that knowledge will make the individual invulnerable. This is a reaction formation against the underlying fear of vulnerability. And C. The idea that knowledge will make the individual worthy. This is largely pathetic. Like all of these fallacies, type 4 contains a denial mechanism, which swings into operation as the fear increases, thus cancelling out the error temporarily, but seriously impairing efficiency. For example, one person might claim she cannot read, while another might claim she cannot, he cannot speak. Note that depression is a real risk here, for a child of God should never reduce his efficiency in any way. The depression comes from a peculiar pseudo-solution which reads, A child of God is efficient. I am not efficient. Therefore, I am not a child of God. This leads to neurotic resignation, and this is a state which merely increases the depression. The corresponding denial mechanism for type 1 is physical inability or impotence. 
the denial mechanism for type 2 is often bankruptcy. Collectors of things often drive themselves well beyond their financial means in an attempt to force discontinuance. If this idea of cessation cannot be tolerated, a strange compromise involving both insatiable possessiveness and insatiable throwing away may result. An example is the inveterate or compulsive gambler, particularly the horse racing addict. Here, the conflicted drive is displaced both from the people and things and invested in animals. The implied derogation of people is the cause of the underlying extreme superstition of the horse racing addict. The alcoholic is in a similar position, except that his hostility is more inward than outward directed. Defences aimed at protecting or retaining error are particularly hard to undo because they introduce second-order misperceptions, which obscure the underlying errors still further. The pseudo-corrective mechanism for type 3 is apt to be more varied because the more inclusive nature of the more inclusive nature of the error, which has already been mentioned. Some of the possibilities are listed below. A. One aspect of the possession possessed conflict can be raised to predominance. If this is attempted in connection with possessing, it leads to the paranoid solution. The underlying component of being possessed is retained in the persecution fantasies which generally occupy the paranoia. B. If being possessed is brought to ascendance, a state of some sort of possession by external forces results, but not with a major emphasis on attacking others. Attack by others becomes the more obvious component. In the more virulent forms, this is a sense of being possessed by demons, and unless this facilitates with A, a catatonic solution, is more likely than a paranoid one. The focused paranoid has become more rigid in his solution and centres on one source of projection to escape from facilitation. It should be noted that this type of paranoia is an upside-down form of religion because of its obvious attempt to unify into oneness. Types 1, 2 and 4 are more likely to produce neurotic rather than psychotic states, though this is by no means guaranteed. However, type 3 is inherently more vulnerable to psychosis, again because of the more fundamental level confusion which is involved. It should be noted that the greater fear which is induced by type 3 can itself reach psychotic proportions, thus forcing the individual closer and closer to a psychotic solution. It is emphasised here that the differences have no effect at all on the miracle, which can heal any of them with equal ease. This is because of the miracle's inherent avoidance of within-error distractions. Its sole concern is to distinguish between truth on the one hand and all kinds of error on the other. This is why some miracles seem to be of greater magnitude than others. But remember the first principle of this course. There is no order of difficulty in miracles. The emphasis on mental illness, which is marked in these notes, reflects the undoing aspect of the miracle. The doing aspect is, of course, much more important, but a true miracle cannot occur on a false basis. Sometimes the undoing must precede it. At other times, both can occur simultaneously. But... You're not up to this at the moment. Further insights into mental illness can be misused and can lead to preoccupation with one's own symptoms. This is why this area is less constructive for most people than a course primarily devoted to mental health. However, some professions will find some principles of mental illness constructive, especially those which are concerned with mental illness in others. This obviously includes psychologists. The obvious correction for all types of the possession fallacy 
is to redefine possession correctly. In the sense of taking over, the concept does not exist at all in divine reality, which is the only level where real existence is meaning, a meaningful term. No one can be taken over unless he wills to be. However, if he places his mind under tyranny rather than true authority, he intrudes the concept of submission, dominance, onto free will himself. This produces the obvious contradiction inherent in any formulation which associates free will with imprisonment. Even in the very mild forms, this kind of association is risky and may spread quite unexpectedly, particularly under external stress. This is because it can be internally controlled only if external conditions are peaceful. This is not safe, because external conditions are produced by the thoughts of many, not all of whom are pure in heart as yet. Why should you be at their mercy? This issue is very closely related to the whole possession issue. You are thinking that people can possess you if you believe that their thoughts or the external environment can affect you, regardless of what they think. You are perfectly unaffected by all expressions of lack of love. These can be either from yourself and others, or from yourself to others, or from others to you. Peace is an attribute in you. You cannot find it outside. All mental illness is some form of external searching. Mental health is inner peace. It enables you to remain unshaken by lack of love from without and capable through your own miracles of correcting the external conditions which proceed from lack of love in others. The cause of the separation. This section deals with a more fundamental misuse of knowledge, referred to in the Bible as the cause of the fall or separation. There are several introductory remarks which are intended to make these explanations less fear-provoking. First, I draw your attention to a couplet from Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. Be as thou wast want to be. See as thou wast want to see. These words were said by Oberon in releasing Titiana from her own errors, both of being and perceiving. These were the words which re-established her true identity, as well as her true abilities and judgment. The similarity to your release is obvious. There are also some dictionary definitions which will be helpful. Their somewhat unusual nature is due to the fact they are not usually the first definitions listed. Nevertheless, the fact that each of them does appear in the dictionary should be reassuring. Project. Verb. To extend forward or out. Project. Noun. A plan in the mind. World. A natural grand division. We will refer later to projection as related to both mental illness and mental health. It has also been commented on that Lucifer literally projected himself from heaven. We also have observed that you can make an empty shell, but cannot make nothing at all. This emptiness provides the screen for the misuse of projection. 
The Garden of Eden, which is described as a literal garden in the Bible, was not originally an actual garden at all. It was merely a mental state of complete need lack. Even in the literal account, it is noteworthy that the pre-separation state was essentially one in which man needed nothing. The tree of knowledge, again, in overly literal concept, as is clearly shown by the subsequent references to eating of the fruit of the tree, is the symbolic reference to some of the misuses of knowledge referred to in the section immediately preceding this one. There is, however, considerable clarification of this concept, which must be understood before the real meaning of the detour into fear can be fully comprehended. Projection, as defined above, this refers to the verb, is a fundamental attribute of God, which he also gave to his Son. In the creation, God projected his creative ability out of himself towards the sons whom he created and also imbued them with the same loving, the same loving will to create. We have commented before on the fundamental error involved in confusing what has been created and what is being made. We have also emphasised that you have not only been fully created, but also been created perfect. There is no emptiness in you. The next point, too, has already been made, but bears repetition here. The Son, because of his own likeness to his Creator, is creative. No child of God is capable of losing this ability because it is inherent in what he is. Whenever projection in its inappropriate sense is utilised, it always implies that some emptiness or lack of everything must exist and that it is within your ability to put your own ideas there instead of the truth. If you will consider carefully what this entails, the following will become quite apparent. First, the assumption is implicit that what God has created can be changed by your own mind. Second, the concept has intruded that what is perfect can be rendered imperfect or wanting. Third, The belief has arisen and is tolerated that you can distort the creations of God, including yourself. Fourth, the idea has entered that since you can create yourself, the direction of your own creation is up to you. These related distortions represent a picture of what actually occurred in the separation. None of this existed before, nor does it actually exist now. The sonship was created as a natural grand division or projecting outward of God. That is why everything which he created is like him. Projection as undertaken by God was very similar to the kind of inner radiance which the children of the Father inherit from him. It is important to note that the term project outward necessarily implies that the real source of projection is internal. This is as true of the Son as of the Father. The kingdom of God, in its original connotation, included both the proper creation of the Son by God and the proper creation by the Son in his right mind. The latter required the endowment of the Son by God with free will, because all loving creation is freely given. 
Nothing in either of these statements implies any sort of levels or in fact anything except one continuous line of creation in which all aspects are of the same order. When the lies of the serpent were introduced, they were called lies because they are not true. When man listened, all he heard was untruth. You do not have to continue to believe what is not true unless you choose to do so. All of your miscreations can disappear in the well-known twinkling of an eye because they are a visual misperception. Your spiritual eye can sleep, but remember, a sleeping eye can still see. One translation of the fall, a view emphasised by Mary Baker Eddy, and worthy of note, is that a deep sleep fell upon Adam. While the Bible, Bible seems to regard this sleep as a kind of anaesthetic utilised for the project, protection of Adam during the creation of Eve, Mrs Eddy was correct in emphasising that nowhere is there any reference made to his waking up. While Christian science is clearly incomplete, the point is much in its favour. The history of humanity in the world as you see it has not been characterised by any genuine or comprehensive reawakening or rebirth. This is impossible as long as humanity projects in the spirit of miscreation. It still remains with you to project as God projected his own spirit to you. In reality, this is your only choice because your free will was made for your own joy in creating the perfect. All fear is ultimately reducible to the basic misperception that you have the ability to usurp the power of God. It is again emphasised that you neither can nor have been able to do this. In this statement lies the real justification for your escape from fear. This is brought about by your acceptance of the atonement, which places you in a position to realise that your own errors never really occurred. When the deep sleep fell upon Adam, he was then in a condition to experience nightmares, precisely because he was sleeping. If a light is suddenly turned on while someone is dreaming and the content of his dream is fearful, he is initially likely to interpret the light itself as part of the content of his own dream. However, as soon as he awakens, the light is correctly perceived as the release from the dream which is no longer accorded reality. I would like to conclude this with the biblical injunction, go and do thou likewise. It is quite apparent that this depends on the kind of knowledge which was not referred to by the tree of knowledge, which bore lies as fruit. The knowledge that illuminates rather than obscures is the knowledge which not only makes you free but also shows you clearly that you are free. The proper use of denial. When you are afraid of anything you are acknowledging its power to hurt you Remember that where your heart is, there is your treasure also. This means that you believe in what you value. If you are afraid, you are valuing wrongly. Human understanding will inevitably value wrongly 
and by endowing all human thoughts with equal power, will inevitably destroy peace. That is why the Bible speaks of the peace of God, which passeth human understanding. This peace is totally incapable of being shaken by human errors of any kind. It denies the ability of anything which is not of God to affect you in any way. This is the proper use of denial. It is not used to hide anything, but it is used to correct error. It brings all error into the light, and since error and darkness are the same, it abolishes error automatically. True denial is a very powerful protective device. You can and should deny any belief that error can hurt you. This kind of denial is not a concealment device but a correction device. The right mind of the mentally healthy depends on it. You can do anything I ask. I have asked you to perform miracles and have made it very clear that these are natural, corrective, healing and universal. There is nothing good they cannot do, but they cannot be performed in the spirit of doubt. You have asked yourself why you cannot really incorporate my words, but remember my own question before you ask yours. O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? The idea of cannibalism in connection with the sacrament is a reflection of a distorted view of sharing. I told you before that the word thirst in connection with the spirit was used because of the limited understanding of those to whom I spoke. I also told you not to use it. The same holds for expressions like feeding on. Symbiosis is misunderstood by the mentally ill who do use it in that way. But I also told you that you must recognise your total dependence on God, a statement which you may have not liked. God and the sons he created are symbiotic, symbiotically related. They are completely dependent on each other. The creation of the Son himself has already been perfectly accomplished, but the creation by sons has not. God created sons so he could depend on them, because he created them perfectly. He gave them his peace so they would not be shaken and would be unable to be deceived. Whenever you are afraid, you are deceived. Your mind is not serving your soul. This literally starves the soul by denying its daily bread. In this connection, there is a poem from the Holy Family that says, where tricks of words are never said, and mercy is as plain as bread. God offers only mercy. Your own words should always reflect only mercy. Because that is what you have received and that is what you should give. Justice is a temporary expedient or an attempt to teach you the meaning of mercy. Its judgmental side arises only because you are capable of injustice, if that is what your mind makes. You are afraid of God's will, because you have used your own will, which he created in the likeness of his own, and you've used it to miscreate. What you do not realise is that the mind can miscreate only when it is not free. An imprisoned mind is, not, mind is not free by definition. It is possessed or held back by 
itself. Its will is therefore limited and not free to assert itself. It is all right to remember the past, provided you also remember that anything you suffer is because of your own errors. As an analogy, imagine a very young child who falls down the stairs when an adult has her arms open in welcome at the bottom of the stairs and who then develops to totally unwarranted fear of that adult. The misstep which causes the child's fall has nothing to do with the adult, just as your own missteps have nothing to do at all with me. Denial of error is a very powerful defence of truth. We have slowly been shifting the emphasis from the negative to the positive use of denial. Remember, we have already stated that denial is not a purely negative device. It results in positive miscreation. That is why the mentally ill do employ it. But remember this thought. Never underestimate the power of denial. In the service of the right hand, the denial of error frees the mind with re and re-establishes the freedom of the will. When the will is really free, it cannot miscreate, but it recognises only truth. False projection arises out of false denial, not out of its proper use. My own role in the atonement is one of true projection. That is, I can project or extend to you the affirmation of truth. If you project error to me or to yourself, you're interfering with the process. My use of projection, which can also be yours, is not based on faulty denial but it does involve the very powerful use of the denial of error. The miracle worker is one who accepts my kind of denial and projection, unites his own inherent abilities to deny and project with mine, and imposes them back on himself and others. This establishes the total lack of threat anywhere, Together, we can then work for the real time of peace, which is eternal. The Reinterpretation of Defences Freud's identification of defence mechanisms was quite correct, as was his recognition of their creative ability. They can indeed produce your perception, both of yourself and your surroundings. But Freud's limitations induced inevitable limits on his own perception. He made two kinds of errors. The first was that he saw only how the mechanisms worked in the mentally ill. The second was his own denial of the mechanism of the atonement. Let us take up the first because a clear understanding of the second depends on it. Denial should be directed only to error, and projection should be limited to truth. You should truly give as you have truly received. The golden rule can work effectively on this basis. Intellectualization is a poor word which stems from the brain-mind confusion. Right-mindedness is better. The device defends the right mind and gives it control over the body. Intellectualization implies a split, whereas right-mindedness involves healing. Withdrawal is properly employed in the service of withdrawing from the desert. It is not a device for escape, but for consolidation. The 
there is only one mind. Disassociation is quite similar. You should split yourself off from error, but only in defence of integration. Detachment is essentially a weaker form of disassociation. This is one of the major areas of withholding that many engage in. Flight can be undertaken in whatever direction you choose. But note that the concept himself implies flight from something. Flight from error is perfectly appropriate. Distanciation is a way of putting distance between yourself and what you should fly from. Regression is a real effort to return to your own original state. In this sense, it is utilised to restore, not to go back to the less mature. Sublimation should be associated with the sublime. There are many other so-called dynamic concepts which are profound errors due essentially to the misuse of defences. Among them is the concept of different levels of aspiration which results from the real level confusion. However, the main point to be understood from these notes is that you can defend truth as well as error. And in fact much better. So far we have concentrated on ends rather than means, but unless you regard an end as worth achieving, you will not devote yourself to the means by which it can be achieved. Your question, how can I incorporate this material, enables me to shift the emphasis from the end to the means. It means you are accepting the end as valuable, thus signifying your willingness to use defences to ensure it. The means are easier to clarify after the true worth of the goal itself is firmly established. Everyone defends his own treasure. You do not have to tell him to do this because he will do so automatically. The real question remains, what do you treasure and how much do you treasure it? Once you learn to consider these two points and bring them into all your actions as the true criteria for behaviour, I will have little difficulty in clarifying the means. You have not learned to be consistent about this yet. I have therefore concentrated on showing you that the means are available whenever you do ask. We can save a lot of time, however, if you do not need to extend this step unduly. The correct focus will shorten it immeasurably. The Atonement as Defence The atonement is the only defence which cannot be used destructively. That is because while everyone must eventually join it, it was not a device which was generated by humanity. The atonement principle was in effect long before the atonement itself was begun. The principle was love. And the atonement itself was an act of love. Acts were not necessary before the separation because the time-space belief did not exist. It was only after the separation that the defence of atonement and the necessary conditions for its fulfilment were planned. It became increasingly apparent that all the defences which humanity can choose to use constructively or destructively were not enough to save it. It was therefore decided that you needed a defence which was so splendid that you could not misuse it, although you could 
refuse it. Your will could not turn it into a weapon of attack, which is the inherent characteristic of all other defences. The atonement thus became the only defence which was not a two-edged sword. The atonement actually began long before the resurrection. Many souls offered their efforts on behalf of the separated ones, but they could not withstand the strength of the attack and had to be brought back. Angels came too, but their protection was not enough because the separated ones were not interested in peace. They had already split themselves and were bent on dividing rather than reintegrating. The levels they introduced into themselves turned against each other, and they in turn turned against one another. They established differences, divisions, cleavages, dispersion and all other concepts related to the increasing splits they produced. Not being in their right minds, they turned their defences from protection to assault and acted literally insanely. It was essential to introduce a split-proof device which could be used only to heal, if it was used at all. The atonement was built into the space-time belief in order to set a limit on the need for the belief and ultimately to make learning complete. The atonement is the final lesson. Learning itself, like the classrooms in which it occurs, is temporary. Let all those who overestimate human intelligence remember this. The ability to learn has no value when change or understanding is no longer necessary. The externally creative have nothing to learn. Only after the separation was it necessary to direct the creative force to learning because changed behaviour had become mandatory. Human beings can learn to improve their behaviour and can also learn to become better and better learners. This increase serves to bring them into closer and closer accord with the sonship. But the sonship itself is a perfect creation. And perfect is not a matter of degree. Only while there are different degrees is learning meaningful. The evolution of humankind is merely a process by which you proceed from one degree to the next. You correct your previous missteps by stepping forward. This represents a process which is actually incomprehensible in temporal terms because you return as you go forward. The atonement is the device by which you can free yourself from the past as you go ahead. It undoes your past errors, thus making it unnecessary for you to keep retracing your steps without advancing towards your return. In this sense, the atonement saves time, but like the miracles, like the miracle which serves it, does not abolish it. But the atonement as a completed plan does not have a unique relationship to time, Until the atonement is finished, its various phases will proceed in time, but the whole atonement stands at its end. At this point, the bridge of the return has been built. If you find discussion of the atonement upsetting, it is because the atonement is a total commitment. You still think that this is associated with loss. This is the same mistake all the separated ones make, in one way or another. They cannot believe that a defence which cannot attack is the best defence. Except for this misperception, the angels could have helped them. What do you think the meek shall inherit the earth means? They will literally take it over because of their strength 
a two-way defence is inherently weak because it has two edges. It can turn against the self very unexpectedly. This tendency cannot be controlled except by miracles. The miracle turns the defence of atonement to the protection of the inner self, which, as it becomes more and more secure, assumes its natural talent for protecting others. The inner self knows itself as both a brother and a son. The Restoration of the Altar As psychologists know, when defences are disrupted, there is a period of real disorientation, accompanied by fear, guilt, and usually facilitation between anxiety and depression. The process discussed here is different only in that defences are not being disrupted, but reinterpreted, even though it may be experienced as the same thing. In the reinterpretation of defences, they are not disrupted, but their use of attack is lost. Since this means that they can be used only one way, they become much stronger and also much more dependable. They no longer oppose the atonement, but greatly facilitate it. The atonement can only be accepted within you, you may perceive it largely as external, and this will make your experience of it minimal. You can be shown the chalice without accepting it for yourself. This is due to the improper use of the defence of externalisation. Do not fail to appreciate, however, how remarkable your progress can be in this respect. You may perceive the chalice at first as a vessel of some sort whose purpose is uncertain. Even then, however, you can notice that inside is gold, while the outside, though shiny, is silver. This is a recognition of the fact that the inner part is more precious than the outer side, even though both are resplendent. The reinterpretation of defences is essential to break open the inner light. Since the separation, defences have been used almost entirely to defend yourself against the atonement and thus maintain your separation. You generally see this as a need to protect the body from external intrusion. Fantasies about the body arise from the erroneous belief that the body can be used as a means for obtaining atonement. Perceiving the body as the temple is only the first step in correcting this kind of distortion. Seeing the body as a temple alters part of the misperception, but not all of it. It does recognise that the concept of atonement in physical terms is not appropriate. But the next step is to realise that the temple is not a building at all. Its real holiness lies in the inner altar around which the building is built. The inappropriate emphasis which people have put on beautiful church buildings is a sign of their own fear of atonement and an unwillingness to reach the altar itself. The real beauty of the temple cannot be seen with the physical eye. The spiritual eye, on the other hand, cannot see the building at all, but it perceives the altar within with perfect clarity. This is because the spiritual eye has perfect vision. For perfect effectiveness, the chalice of the atonement belongs at the centre of the inner altar, where it undoes the separation and restores the wholeness of the mind. Before the separation, the mind was invulnerable to fear, because fear did not exist. Both the separation and the fear were miscreations of the mind, which have to be now undone. 
This is what the Bible means by the restoration of the temple. It does not mean the restoration of the building, but it does mean the opening of the altar to receive the atonement. This heals the separation and places within you the one defence against all errors, which can make you perfectly invulnerable. The acceptance of the atonement by everyone is only a matter of time. In fact, both time and matter were made for this purpose. This appears to contradict free will because of the inevitability of the decision. If you review the idea carefully, however, you will realise that this is not true. Everything is limited in some way by the manner of its creation. Free will can temporise and is capable of enormous procrastination, but it cannot depart entirely from its creator, who sets limits on its ability to miscreate by virtue of its own real purpose. The misuse of will engenders a situation which in the extreme becomes altogether intolerable. Pain thresholds can be high, but they are not limitless. Eventually, everybody begins to recognise, however dimly, that there must be a better way. As this recognition is more firmly established, it becomes a perceptual turning point. The, uh, this ultimately reawakens the spiritual eye, simultaneously weakening the investment in physical sight. The alternating investment in the two types of levels of perception is usually experienced as a conflict for a long time and become, can become very acute. But the outcome is as certain as God. The spiritual eye literally cannot see error and merely looks for atonement. All of the solutions which the physical eyes seek dissolve in its sight the spiritual eye, which looks within, recognises immediately that the altar has been defiled and needs to be repaired and protected. Perfectly aware of the right defence, it passes over all others, looking past error to truth. Because of the real strength of its vision, it pulls the will into its own service and forces the mind to concur. This re-establishes the true power of the will and makes it increasingly unable to tolerate delay. The mind then realises with growing certainty that delay is only a way of increasing unnecessary pain, which, is, need, not, which it need not tolerate at all. The pain threshold drops accordingly and the mind becomes increasingly sensitive to what it would once have regarded as a very minor intrusions of discomfort. The children of God are entitled to perfect comfort, which comes from a sense of perfect trust. Until they achieve this, they will waste themselves and their true creative powers on useless attempts to make themselves more comfortable by inappropriate means. But the real means is already provided and does not involve any effort on their part at all. Their egocentricity usually misinterprets this as personally insulting, as an interpretation which obviously arises from the misperception of themselves. Egocentricity and communion cannot coexist. Even the terms themselves are contradictory. The atonement is the only gift which is worthy of being offered to the altar of God. This is because of the inestimable value of the altar itself. It was created perfect and is entirely worthy of receiving perfection. God is lonely without his sons and they are lonely without him. Remember the poem which begins, And God stepped out on space, 
And he looked around and said, I'm lonely, I'll make me a world. The world was a way of healing the separation and the atonement is the guarantee that the device will ultimately do so. The miracle as the means of healing. The new emphasis will now be on healing. The miracle is the means, the atonement, the principle, and the healing is the result. Those who speak of the miracle of healing are combining two orders of reality inappropriately. Healing is not a miracle. The atonement, or the final miracle, is purely a means, while any type of healing is a result. Atonement is the remedy. The degree of error to which it is applied is irrelevant. Essentially, all healing is the release from fear. But to undertake this, you cannot be fearful yourself. You do not understand healing because of your own fear. I have been hinting throughout that you must heal others. The reason is that their he healing merely witnesses to yours. A major step in the atonement plan is to undo error at all levels. Illness, which is really not right-mindedness, is the result of level confusion in the sense that it always entails the belief that what is amiss in one level can adversely affect another. We have constantly referred to miracles as the means of correcting level confusion. In reality, all mistakes must be corrected at the level at which they occur. Only the mind is capable of error. The body can act erroneously, but this is only because it has responded to a misthought. The body cannot create, and to believe that it can, a fundamental error responsible for most of the fallacies already referred to, produces all physical symptoms. All physical illness represents a belief in magic. The whole distortion which made magic rested on the belief that there is a creative ability in matter which can control the mind. This fallacy can work either way. That is, it can be believed either that the mind can miscreate in the body or that the body can miscreate in the mind. If it can be made clear that the mind, which is the only level of causation, cannot generate effects beyond itself, then neither confusion need occur. The reason why only the mind can make or create is more obvious than may be immediately apparent. Spirit has been created. The body is a learning device for the mind. Learning devices are not lessons in themselves. Their purpose is merely to facilitate the thinking of the learner. The most that a faulty use of a learning device can do is to fail to facilitate learning. It does not have the power in itself to introduce actual learning errors. The body, if properly understood, shares the invulnerability of the atonement to two-edged application. This is not because the body is a miracle, but because it is not inherently open to misinterpretation. The body is merely a fact in this world. Its abilities can be, and frequently are, over-evaluated However, it is almost impossible to deny its existence in this world. 
those who do are engaging in a particularly unworthy form of denial. The use of the word unworthy here implies simply that it is not necessary to protect the mind by, by denying the unmindful. There is little doubt that the mind can miscreate. If one denies this unfortunate aspect of its power, one is also denying the power itself. All material means which you accept as remedies for bodily ills are simply restatements of magic principles. It was the first level of the error to believe that the body created its own illness. Thereafter, it is a second misstep to attempt to heal it through non-creative agents. It does not follow, however, that the application of these very weak corrective devices is evil. Sometimes the illness has sufficiently greater hold over an individual's mind to render him inaccessible to atonement. In this case, one may be wise to utilise a compromise approach to mind and body, in which something from the outside is temporarily given healing belief. This is because the last thing that can help the non-right-minded or the sick is an increase in fear. They are already in a fear-weakened state. If they are inappropriately exposed to a straight and undiluted miracle, they may be precipitated into panic. This is particularly likely to occur when upside-down perception has induced the belief that miracles are frightening. The value of the atonement does not lie in the manner in which it is expressed. In fact, if it is truly used, it will inevitably be expressed in whatever way is most helpful to the receiver, not the giver. This means that a miracle to attain its full efficacy must be expressed in a language which the recipient can understand without fear. It does not follow by any means that this is the highest level of communication of which he is capable, but it does mean that it is the highest level of communication of which he is capable now. The whole aim of the miracle is to raise the level of communication not to impose regression in the improper sense upon it. Before it is safe to let miracle workers loose in this world, it is essential that they understand fully the fear of release. Otherwise, they may unwittingly foster the belief that release is imprisonment, which is very prevalent. This misperception arose from the attempted protection device or misused defence that harm can be limited to the body. This was because of the much greater fear, which this one counteracts, that the mind can hurt itself. Neither error is really meaningful, because the miscreations of the mind do not really exist. That recognition is a far better protection device than any form of level confusion because of the advantages of introducing correction at the level of the error. It is essential that the remembrance remain with you that only mind can make or create. Implicit in this is the corollary that correction belongs at the thought level and not at either level to which correction is inapplicable. To repeat an earlier statement, and also to extend it somewhat, spirit is already perfect, and therefore does not require correction. The body does not really exist, except as a learning device for the mind. This learning device is not subject to errors of its own, because it was made, but does not make. It should be obvious then that correcting the maker 
or inducing it to give up miscreation is the only application of creative power which is inherently meaningful at all. We said before that magic is essentially mindless or the destructive miscreative use of mind. Physical medicines are a form of spells. In one way, they are a more benign form in that they do not entail the possession fallacy, which does enter when a mind believes that it can possess another. Since this is considerably less dangerous, though still incorrect, it has its advantages. It is particularly helpful to the therapist who really wants to heal, but is still fearful himself. By using physical means to do so, he is not engaging in any form of enslavement, even though he is not applying the atonement. This means that his mind is dulled by fear, but is not actively engaged in distortion. Those who are afraid of using the mind to heal are right in avoiding it because the very fact they are afraid has made them vulnerable to miscreation. They are therefore likely to misunderstand any healing they might induce and because egocentricity and fear usually occur together, may be unable to accept the real source of the healing. Under these conditions, it is safer for them to rely temporarily on physical healing devices because they cannot misperceive them as their own creations. As long as their own vulnerability persists, it is essential to preserve them from even attempting miracles. The sole responsibility of the miracle worker. We said in a previous section that the miracle is an expression of miracle mindedness. Miracle mindedness merely means right mindedness in the sense that we are now using it. Right mindedness neither exalts nor depreciates the mind of the miracle worker or of the miracle receiver. However, as a creative act, the miracle need not wait, await the right-mindedness of the receiver. In fact, its purpose is to restore him to his right mind. But it is essential that the miracle worker be in his right mind, or he will be a, unable to re-establish right-mindedness in someone else. The healer who relies on his own readiness, is endangering his understanding. He is perfectly safe as long as he is completely unconcerned about his readiness, but maintains a consistent trust in mine. Errors of this kind produce some very erratic behaviour, which usually points up an underlying unwillingness to cooperate. These errors inevitably introduce inefficiency into the miracle worker's behaviour and temporarily disrupt his miracle mindedness. We have established that for all corrective processes, the first step is to know that this is fear. Unless fear had entered, the corrective procedure would never have become necessary. If your miracle working propensities are not working, it is always because fear has intruded on your right mindedness and has literally upset, upset it, i.e. turned it upside down. All forms of not right mindedness are the result of refusal to accept the atonement for yourself. If the miracle worker does not accept it, he places himself in the position to recognise that those who need to be healed are simply those who have not done so. 
when you feel the vast radiation range of your own inner illumination, it will be because you are aware that your right-mindedness is healing. The sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept atonement himself. This means that he knows that mind is the only creative level and that his errors are healed by the atonement. Once he accepts this, his mind can only heal. By denying his mind any destructive potential and reinstating its purely constructive powers, he has placed himself in a position where he can undo the level confusion of others. The message which he then gives to others is the truth that their minds are really similarly constructive and that their own miscreations cannot hurt them. By affirming this, the miracle worker releases the mind from over-evaluating its own learning device, the body, and restores the mind to its true position as the learner. It should be re-emphasised that the body does not learn any more than it creates. As a learning device, it merely follows the learner. But if it is falsely endowed with self-initiative, it becomes a serious obstruction to the learning it should facilitate. Only the mind is capable of illumination. Spirit is already illuminated and the body in itself is too dense. The mind, however, can bring its own illumination to the body by recognising that density is the opposite of intelligence and therefore unnameable to independent learning. It is, however, easily brought into alignment with a mind which has learned to look beyond density toward light. Corrective learning always begins with awakening the spiritual eye and turning away from belief in physical sight. The reason this entails fear is because you are afraid of what your spiritual eye will see, which is why you closed it in the first place. We said before that the spiritual eye cannot see error and is capable only of looking beyond it to the defence of atonement. There is no doubt that the spiritual eye does produce extreme discomfort by what it sees. The thing that you forget is that the discomfort is not the final outcome of its perception. When the spiritual eye is permitted to look upon the defilement of the altar, it also it looks immediately toward atonement. Nothing which the spiritual eye perceives can induce fear. Everything that results from accurate spiritual awareness merely is channelized toward correction. Discomfort is aroused only to bring the need to correct forcibly into awareness. What the physical eye sees is not corrective, nor can it be properly corrected by any device which can be physically seen. As long as you believe in what your physical sight tells you, all your corrective behaviour will be misdirected. The reason why the real vision is obscured is because you cannot endure to see your own defiled altar. But since the altar has been been defiled, this fact becomes doubly dangerous unless it is perceived. This perception is totally non-threatening because of the atonement. The fear of healing arises in the end from an unwillingness to accept the unequivocal fact that healing is necessary. The fear arises because of the necessary willingness to look at what you have done to yourself. Healing was an ability which was lent to human beings after the separation, before which it was completely unnecessary. 
Like all aspects of space-time belief, healing ability is temporary. However, as long as time persists, healing remains among the stronger human protections. This is because healing always rests on charity, and charity is a way of perceiving the true perfection of another, even if he cannot perceive it himself. Most of the loftier concepts of which humanity is capable now are time-dependent. Charity is really a weaker reflection of a much more powerful love encompassment which is far beyond any form of charity and humanity can conceive of as yet. Charity is essential to right-mindedness in that the limited sense in which right-mindedness can now be attained. Charity is a way of looking at another as if he had already gone far beyond his actual accomplishment in time. Since his own thinking is faulty, he cannot see the atonement for himself or he would have no need for charity at all. The charity which is accorded him is both an acknowledgement that he is weak and a recognition that he could be stronger. The way in which both of these beliefs are stated clearly implies their dependence on time, making it quite apparent that charity lies within the framework of human limitations though toward the higher levels. We said before that only revelation transcends time. The miracle, as an expression of true human charity, can only shorten it at best. It must be understood, however, that whenever you offer a miracle to another, you are shortening the suffering of both. This introduces a correction into the record, which corrects retroactively as well as progressively. The Correction of Fear You believe that being afraid is involuntary, but I've told you many times that only constructive acts should be involuntary. I said that Christ's control can take over everything that doesn't matter, and Christ's guidance can di direct everything that does, if you so will. Fear cannot be Christ-controlled, but it can be self-controlled. Fear is always associated with what does not matter and prevents me from controlling it. The correction is therefore a matter of your will, because its presence shows that you have raised the unimportant to a higher level than it warrants. You have thus brought it under your will, where it does not belong. This means you feel responsible for it. The level confusion here is perfectly obvious. The reason that I cannot control fear for you is that you are attempting to raise to the mind level the proper content of lower order reality. I do not foster level confusion, but you can will to correct it. You would not intolerate insane behaviour on your part and would hardly advance the excuse that you could not help it. Why should you tolerate insane thinking? There is a fallacy here you would do well to look at clearly. You believe that you are responsible for what you do, but you do not, but not for what you think. The truth is that you are responsible for what you think, because it is at this level only that you can exercise choice. What you do comes from what you think. You cannot separate the two by giving autonomy to your behaviour. Behaviour is controlled by me automatically as soon as you place what you think under my guidance. Whenever you are afraid, 
It is a sure sign that you have allowed your mind to miscreate. That is, you have not allowed me to guide it. It is pointless to believe that controlling the outcome of misthought can result in real healing. When you are fearful, you have willed wrongly. This is why you feel you are responsible for it. You must change your mind, not your behaviour. And this is a matter of will. You do not need guidance, except at the mind level. Correction belongs only at the level where causation is possible. The term does not really mean anything at the symptom level, where it cannot work. The correction of fear is your responsibility. When you ask for release from fear, you are implying that it isn't. You should ask instead for help in conditions which have brought the fear about. This always entails a willingness on the part of your separated mind. At this level, you can help it. You are much too tolerant of mind-wandering, thus tactily condoning your mind's miscreations. The particular result never matters, but this fundamental error does. The fundamental correction is always the same. Before you will to do anything, Ask me if your will is in accord with mine. If you are sure that it is, there will be no fear. Fear is always a sign of strain, which arises whenever the will to do conflicts with what you do. This situation arises in two major ways. One, you can will to do conflicting things, either simultaneously or successively. This produces conflicting behaviour, which would be tolerable, tolerable to the self, though not necessarily to others, except for the fact that the part of the will that wants something else is outraged. Two, you can behave as you think you should, without entirely willing to do so. This produces consistent behaviour, but entails great strain within the self. If you think about it, you will realise that in both cases the will and the behaviour are out of accord, resulting in a situation in which you are doing what you do not will. This arouses a sense of coercion, which usually produces rage. The anger then invades the mind and projection in the wrong sense becomes likely. Depression or anxiety is virtually certain. Remember that whenever there is fear, it is because you have not made up your mind. Your will is split and your behaviour inevitably becomes erratic. Correcting at the behavioural level, level can shift the error from the first type to the second, but will not obliterate the fear. It is possible to reach a state in which you bring your will under guidance without much conscious effort, but this implies the kind of habit pattern which you have not developed dependably as yet. Although people say that God will never ask you to do more than you can, they do not understand it themselves. God cannot ask more than you will. The strength to do comes from your own undivided will to do. There is no strain in doing God's will as soon as it is also your own. The lesson here is quite simple. 
but particularly apt to be overlooked. I will therefore repeat it, urging you to listen. Only your mind can produce fear. It does so whenever it is conflicted in what it wills, thus producing inevitable strain because willing and doing become discordant. This cannot be corrected by better doing. It can be corrected by higher willing. The first corrective step is knowing it is fear. After taking this step, you might benefit temporarily by adding another step before going on with the corrective process. Try saying to yourself that you must have willed not to love somehow or somewhere, or the fear which arises from behaviour will, conflict could not have happened. Then follow the previous instructions. If you consider what the process really means, it is nothing more than a series of pragmatic steps in the larger process of attempting the atonement as the remedy. From this viewpoint, the steps can be reworded as follows. 1. No first, this is fear. 2. Fear arises from lack of love. 3. The only remedy for lack of love is perfect love. 4. Perfect love is the atonement. The final procedural step is inherent in the last statement. We have emphasised that the miracle or the expression of atonement is always a sign of real respect from the worthy to the worthy. This worth is re-established by the atonement. It is obvious then that when you are afraid, you have placed yourself in a position where you need atonement because you have done something loveless, having willed without love. This is precisely the situation for which the atonement was offered. The need for the remedy inspired its establishment. As long as you recognise only the need for the remedy, you will remain fearful. However, as soon as you use the remedy, you have also abolished the fear. This is how true healing occurs. It may help if you say this prayer to me, I would like to pray that my will be united with thine, recognising that thy perfect love will suffice or correct for my imperfect love. I pray that I may accept the atonement with conviction, recognising its inestimable worth and my own divine worth as part of this identification with thine. I pray that my fear be replaced by an active sense of thy love and thy continual willingness to help me overcome the split or divided will which is responsible for my difficulty with this. I accept the divinity of the messages I have received and affirm my will in both accepting and acting upon the atonement principle. Here I am. The major problem that you have is the continuing split will, which naturally interferes with your true identification. To the extent that you hold on to this split, it will take longer to get through 
and will markedly interfere with your own integration efforts. Reliance has to be placed on me, which is sufficient once you do this without distanciation or division of loyalties. This will be strengthened through a continual affirmation of the goal you want to achieve and an awareness of its inevitability. In this way, you will perceive and know your true worth and the importance of maintaining a complete identification. The real power of the mind. Everyone experiences fear and nobody enjoys it. Yet it would take very little right thinking to know why it occurs. Very few people appreciate the real power of the mind and nobody remains fully aware of it all the time. This is inevitable in this world because the human being has many things he must do and cannot engage in constant thought watching. However, if he hopes to spare himself from fear, there are some things he must realise and realise fully, at least some of the time. The mind is a very powerful agent and it never loses its creative force. It never sleeps. Every instant it is making or creating and always as you will. Many of your ordinary expressions reflect this. For example, when you say, don't give it a thought, you're implying that if you do not think about something, it will have no effect on you. This is true enough. On the other hand, many other expressions are clear expressions of the prevailing lack of awareness of thought power. For example, you say, just an idle thought, and mean that the thought has no effect. You also speak of some actions as thoughtless, implying that if the person had thought, he would not have behaved as he did. You also use phrases like thought-provoking, which is bland enough, but the term a provoking thought means something quite different. While expressions like think big give some recognition to the power of thought, they will come nowhere near the truth. You do not expect to grow when you say it, because you really don't believe it. It is hard to recognise that thought and belief combine into a power surge that can literally move mountains. It appears at first glance that to believe such power about yourself is merely arrogant. But that is not the real reason why you don't believe it. People prefer to believe that their thoughts cannot exert real control because they are literally afraid of them. Therapists try to help people who are afraid of their own death wishes by depreciating the power of the wish. They even attempt to free the patient by persuading him that he can think whatever he wants without any real effect at all. There is a real dilemma here, which only the truly right-minded can escape. Death wishes do not kill in the physical sense but they do kill spiritually. All destructive thinking is dangerous. Given a death wish, a person has no choice except to act upon his thought or behave contrary to it. He can thus choose only between homicide and fear. The other possibility is that he depreciates the power of his thought. This is the usual psychoanalytic approach. This does allay guilt, but at the cost of rendering thinking impotent. If you believe that what you think is ineffectual, you may cease to be overly afraid of it, but you are hardly like to respect it either. 
The world is full of endless examples of how people have depreciated themselves because they are afraid of their own thoughts. In some forms of insanity, thoughts are glorified, but this is only because the underlying depreciation is too effective for tolerance. The truth is that there are no idle thoughts. All thinking produces form at some level. The reason why people are afraid of ESP and so often react against it is because they know that thoughts can hurt them. Their own thoughts have made them vulnerable. You who complain about fear still persist in producing it most of the time. I told you in the last section that you cannot ask me to release you from it because I know it does not exist. You don't. If I merely intervened between your thoughts and their results, I would be tampering with the basic law of cause and effect. In fact, the most fundamental one there is in this world. I would hardly help you if I depreciated the power of your own thinking. This would be in direct opposition to the purpose of this course. It is certainly much more useful for me to remind you that you do not guard your thoughts at all carefully, except for a relatively small part of the day, and somewhat inconsistently even then. You may feel at this point that it would take a miracle to enable you to do this, which is perfectly true. Human beings are not used to miraculous thinking, but they can be trained to think that way. All miracle workers have to be trained that way. I have to be able to count on them. This means that I cannot allow them to leave their minds unguarded or they will not be able to help me. Miracle working entails a full realisation of the power of thought and real avoidance of miscreation, otherwise the miracle would be necessary merely to set the mind itself straight. A circular process which would hardly foster the time collapse for which the miracle was intended, nor would it induce the healthy respect which every miracle worker must have for true cause and effect. Miracles cannot free the miracle worker from fear. Both miracles and fear come from his thoughts. And if he were not free to choose one, he would also not be free to choose the other. Remember, we said before that when electing one person, you reject another. It is much the same in electing the miracle. By so doing, you have rejected fear, but fear cannot assail unless it has been elected. You have been afraid of God, of me, of yourself, and of practically everyone you know at one time or another. This can only be because you have miscreated all of us and believe in what you made. You would never have done this if you had not been afraid of your own thoughts. The vulnerable are essentially miscreators because they misperceive creation. The basic conflict. You are willing to accept primarily what does not change your mind too much and leaves you free to leave it quite unguarded most of the time. You persist in believing that when you do not consciously watch your mind, it is unmindful. It is time to consider the whole world of unconscious or unwatched mind. This will frighten you because It is the source of fright. You may look at it as a new theory of basic conflict if you wish, which will not be entirely an intellectual approach, but I doubt if the truth will escape you entirely. The unwatched mind is responsible for the whole content of the unconscious which lies above the miracle level. All psychoanalytic theorists have made some contribution to the truth in this connection, 
but none of them has seen it in its true entirety. Jung's best contribution was an awareness of individual versus collective unconscious levels. He also recognised the major place of the religious spirit in, his, in the schema. His archetypes were also meaningful concepts, but his major error lay in regarding the deepest level of the unconscious as shared in terms of content. The deepest level of the unconscious is shared as an ability. As miracle-mindedness, the content or the particular miracles which an individual happens to perform does not matter at all. They will in fact be entirely different, since I direct them, because I make a point of avoiding redundancy. Unless a miracle actually heals, it is not a miracle at all. The content of the miracle level is not recorded in the individual's unconscious because if it were, the miracle would not be automatic or involuntary, which we have said repeatedly that it should be. However, the content is a matter for the record, which is not within the individual himself. All psychoanalysts made one common error in that they attempted to uncover unconscious content. You cannot understand unconscious activity in these terms because content is applicable only to the more superficial unconscious levels to which the individual himself contributes. This is the level at which he can readily introduce fear, and usually does. Freud was right in calling this level pre-conscious and emphasising that there is a fairly easy interchange between pre-conscious and conscious material. He was also right in regarding the censor as an agent for the protection of conscious, consciousness from fear. His major error lay in his insistence that the pre-conscious is necessary at all in the psychic structure. If the psyche contains fearful levels from which it cannot escape without splitting its integration is permanently threatened, it is essential not to control the fearful, but to eliminate it. Here, Rank's concept of the will was particularly good, except that he preferred to allay it only with humanity's only true creative ability, but did not extend it to its proper union with God's. His birth trauma, another valid idea, was also too limited in that it did not refer to the separation which was really a false idea of birth. Physical birth is not a trauma in itself. It can, however, remind the individual of the separation which was a very real cause of fear. The idea of will therapy was potentially a very powerful one. But Rank did not see its real potential because he himself used his mind partly to create a theory of the mind, but also partly to attack Freud. His reactions to Freud stemmed from his own unfortunate acceptance of the deprivation fallacy, which itself arose from the separation. This led him to believe that his own mind's creation could stand only if the creation of another's fell, in consequence, his theory emphasised rather than minimised the two-edged nature of defences. This is an outstanding characteristic of his concepts because it was outstandingly true of him. He also misinterpreted the birth trauma in a way that made it inevitable for him to attempt a therapy whose goal was to abolish fear. This is characteristic of all latter theor theorists who do not attempt, as Freud did in his own form of therapy, to split off the fear. No one as yet has fully recognised either the therapeutic value of fear or the only way in which it can truly be ended. When you miscreate, you are in pain. The cause and effect principle here is temporarily a real expediator. Actually, cause is a term properly belonging to God, and effect, which should be also capitalised, is his sonship. 
This entails a set of cause and effect relationships which are totally different from those which humanity introduced into the miscreation. The fundamental opponents in the real basic conflict are creation and miscreation. All fear is implicit in the second, just as all love is inherent in the first. Because of this difference, the basic conflict is one between love and fear. So much then for the true nature of the major opponents of the basic conflict. Since all such theories lead to a form of therapy in which redistribution of psychic energy results, it is necessary to consider our concept of psychic energy next. In this respect, Freud was more accurate than his followers, who were essentially more wishful. Energy can emanate from both creation and miscreation, and the particular ratio between them, which prevails at a given point in time, does determine the behaviour at that time. If miscreation did not engender energy in its own right, it would be unable to produce destructive behaviour which it very patently does. Everything that you make has energy, because, like the creation of God, it comes from energy and is endowed by its maker with the power to make. Miscreation is still a genuine creative act in terms of the underlying impulse, but not in terms of the content of what is made. This does not deprive what is made of its own creative power. It does, however, guarantee that the power will be misused or used fearfully. To deny this is merely the previously mentioned fallacy of depreciation. Although Freud made a number of fallacies of his own, he did avoid this one in connection with psychic energy. The later theorists denied the split energy concept, not by attempting to heal it, but reinterpreting it instead of redistributing it. This placed them in the illogical position of assuming that the split, which their therapies were intended to heal, had not occurred. The result of this approach is essentially a form of hypnosis. This is quite different from Freud's approach, which merely ended in a deadlock. A similar deadlock occurs when both the power of creation and of miscreation coexist. This is experienced as conflict only because the individual feels as if both were occurring at the same level. He believes in what he has miscreated in his own unconsciousness and he naturally believes it is real because he has made it. He thus places himself in a position where the fearful becomes real. Nothing but level confusion can result as long as this belief is held in any form. Inappropriate denial, an equally inappropriate identification of the real factors of the basic conflict, will not solve the problem itself. The conflict cannot disappear until it is fully recognised that miscreation is not real, and therefore there is no conflict. This entails a full realisation of the basic fact that you have miscreated in a very genuine sense. You need neither continue to do so, nor to suffer from your past errors in this respect. A redistribution of psychic energy, then, is not the solution. Both the idea that both kinds must exist and belief that one kind is amenable for use or misuse are real distortions. The only way out is to stop miscreating now and accept the atonement for miscreations of the past. Only this can re-establish true single-mindedness. The structure of the psyche follows along the lines of the particular libido concept of theorist the theorist employs. Freud's psyche was essentially a good and evil picture, with very heavy weight given to the evil. This is because every time I mentioned the atonement to him, which was quite often, he responded by defending his theory more and more against it. 
This resulted in his increasingly strong attempts to make the illogical sound more and more logical. I was very sorry about this because his was a singularly good mind and it was a shame to waste it. However, the major purpose of his incarnation was not neglected. He did succeed in forcing recognition of the unconscious into humanity's calculations about itself, a step in the right direction which should not be minimised. Freud was one of the most religious men I have known recently. Unfortunately, he was so afraid of religion that the only way he could deal with it was to regard it, not himself, as sick. This naturally prevented healing. Freud's superego is a particularly interesting example of the real power of miscreation. It is noteworthy throughout the whole development of his theories that the superego never allied itself with freedom. The most it could do in this direction was to work out a painful truce in which both opponents lost. This perception could not fail to force him to emphasise discomfort in his view of civilization. The Freudian idea is really only the more superficial level of the unconscious and not the deepest level at all. This too was inevitable because Freud could not divorce miracles from magic. It was therefore his constant endeavour, even preoccupation, to keep on thrusting more and more material between consciousness and the real deeper level of the unconscious, so that the latter became increasingly obscured. The result was a kind of bedlam, in which there was no order, no control and no sense. This was exactly how he felt about it. The later theoretical switch to the primacy of anxiety was an interesting device intended to deny, deny both the instinctive nature of destructiveness and the force of the power of miscreation. By placing the emphasis on the result, the generative nature of the power was minimised. Destructive behaviour is instinctual. The instinct for creation is not obliterated in miscreation. That is why it is always invested with reality. One of the chief ways in which you can correct your own magic miracle confusion is to remember that you did not create yourself. You are apt to forget this when you become egocentric and this places you in a position where belief in a magic is virtually inevitable. Your instincts for creation were given you by your own creator who was expressing the same instinct in his creation. Since the creative ability rests solely in the mind, everything which you make or create is necessarily instinctive. It also follows that whatever you produce is real in your own eyes, but not necessarily in the sight of God. The Mastery of Love We have already said that the basic conflict is one between love and fear, and that the proper organisation of the psyche rests on a lack of level confusion. The section on psychic energy should be reread very carefully because it is particularly likely to be misinterpreted until this section has been completed. It has already been said that you cannot control fear because you yourself made it. Your belief in it renders it out of your control by definition. For this reason, any attempt to resolve the basic conflict through the concept of mastery of fear is meaningless. In fact, it asserts the power of fear by the simple assumption that it need be mastered at all. The essential resolution rests entirely on the mastery of love. 
In the interim, conflict is inevitable. The reason for this is the strangely illogical position in which you have placed yourself. Since we have frequently emphasised that correction must be applied within the level that error occurs, it should be clear that the miracle must be illogical because its purpose is to correct the illogical and restore order. Two concepts which cannot coexist are nothing and everything. To whatever extent one is believed in, the other has been abolished. In the conflict, fear is really nothing and love is really everything. The unwillingness to let one's darkness be seen or to submit error to light is a way of denying that the separation ever occurred. Like all pseudo-solutions, this kind of distorted thinking is very creative, but false. The separation has occurred. To deny this is merely to misuse denial. However, to concentrate on error is merely a further misuse of legitimate psychic mechanisms. The true corrective procedure, which has already been described as the proper use of the spiritual eye or true vision, is to accept the error temporarily, but only as an indication that immediate correction is mandatory. This establishes a state of mind in which the atonement can be accepted without delay. It is worth repeating that ultimately there is no compromise possible between everything and nothing. The purpose of time is essentially to serve as a device by which all compromise in this respect can be abolished. It seems to be abolished by degrees precisely because time itself involves a concept of intervals which does not really exist. The faulty use of creation has made this necessary as a corrective device. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life needs only one slight correction to be entirely meaningful and in this context. It should read, And God so loved the world that he gave it to his only begotten Son. It should be noted that God has begotten only one Son. If you believe that all of the minds of God created are his sons, and if you so believe that the sonship is one, then every mind must be a son of God, or an integral part of the sonship. You do not find the concept that the whole is greater than its parts difficult to understand. You should, therefore, not have too great a difficulty with this. The sonship is in its oneness, does transcend the sum of its parts. However, it loses this special state as long as any of its parts are missing. This is why the conflict cannot ultimately be resolved until all the individual parts of the sonship have returned. Only then can the meaning of wholeness in the true sense be understood. The concept of minus numbers has always been regarded as a mathematical rather than actual expedient. Yet, it represents a major limitation on mathematics as presently understood. Any statement which implies degrees of difference in negation is essentially meaningless. What can replace this negative approach is a recognition of the fact as long as one part, which is the same as a million or ten or eight thousand parts, of the sonship is missing, it is not complete. In the divine psyche, the Father and the Holy Spirit are not incomplete at all. 
The sonship has the unique faculty of believing in error or incompleteness if it so elects. However, it is quite apparent that so to elect is to believe in the existence of nothingness. The correction of this error is the atonement. We have already briefly spoken about readiness, but there are some additional awarenesses which might be helpful. Readiness is nothing more than the prerequisite for accomplishment. The two should not be confused. As soon as a state of readiness occurs, there is always some will to accomplish, but this is by no means undivided. The state does not imply more than the potential for a shift of will. Confidence cannot develop fully until mastery has been accomplished. We began this section with an attempt to correct the fundamental human error that fear can be mastered. The correction was that only love can be mastered. Even if you are ready for revelation, though, that does not mean that you have in any way mastered that form of communication. Mastery of love necessarily involves a much more complete confidence in the ability than you have as yet attained. Readiness, however, is at least an indication that you believe this is possible. This is only the beginning of confidence. In case this be misunderstood as a statement that a, an enormous amount of time will be necessary between readiness and mastery, I would again remind you that time and space are under my control. The Real Meaning of the Last Judgment We have said that whatever you make or create is real in your own eyes, but not necessarily in the sight of God. The basic distinction leads us into the real meaning of the last judgment. The final judgment is one of the greatest threat concepts in humanity's perception. This is only because you do not understand it. Judgment is not an essential attribute of God. You brought judgment into being only because of the separation. God himself is still the God of mercy. After the separation, however, there was a place for justice in the schema because it was one of the many learning devices which had to be built into the overall plan. Just as the separation occurred over many millions of years, the last judgment will extend over a similarly long period, and perhaps even longer. Its length depends, however, on the effectiveness of the present speed-up. We have frequently noted that the miracle is a device for shortening, but not abolishing time. If a sufficient number of people become truly miracle-minded quickly, the shortening process can be almost immeasurable. But it is essential that those individuals free themselves from fear sooner than would ordinarily be the case, because they must emerge from the basic conflict if they are to bring peace to the minds of others. The Last Judgment is generally thought of as a procedure undertaken by God. Actually, it will be undertaken solely by the Sonship, with my help. It is a final healing rather than a metting out of punishment, however much you may think punishment is deserved. Punishment as a concept is in total opposition to right-mindedness. The aim of the final judgment is to restore right-mindedness to you. The final judgment might be called a process of right evaluation. It simply means that finally all minds must come to understand what is worthy and what is not. 
After this, their ability to choose can be reasonably directed. Unless this distinction has been made, the facilitations between free and imprisoned will cannot but continue. The first step toward freedom then must entail a shortening out of the false from the true. This is a process of division only in the constructive sense and reflects the true meaning of the apocalypse. Everyone will ultimately look upon what he has made and will to preserve only what is good, just as God himself once looked upon what he had created and knew that it was good. At this point, the mind will begin to look with love on what it has made because of its great worthiness. The mind will inevitably disown its miscreations and having withdrawn belief from them, they will no longer exist. The term last judgment is frightening, not only because it has been falsely projected onto God, but also because of the association of last with death. This is an outstanding example of upside-down perception. Actually, if the last judgment is examined objectively, it is quite apparent that it is really the doorway to life. No one who lives in fear is really alive. Your own final judgment cannot be directed toward yourself because you are not your own creation. You can apply it meaningfully and at any time, however, to everything you have ever made and retain in your real memory only what is good. This is what your own right-mindedness cannot but dictate. The purpose of time is solely to give you time to achieve this judgment. It is your own perfect judgment of what you have made. When everything that you retain is lovable, there is no reason for any fear to remain in you. This is your part in the atonement.